You could read Isaiah 53 to your Jewish friend, and they will often think that you are reading the New Testament to them. They'll say, why are you reading the New Testament to me? And you can say, no, I am reading Isaiah 53 to you, my friend. And they're blown away by it. They're like, what? And a lot of them become believers after that. Did you know that? So Isaiah 53, this is uh, the one for Israel channel has this guy right here. And, he, and these, are, these are awesome, awesome testimonies. You can check them out at their YouTube channel or their website, one for Israel. Check them out. I promise you, you'll be blessed. But these testimonies like this man right here, he said he heard Isaiah 53 and he realized that he was seeing the good news of Jesus Christ. He thought it was the New Testament too. A lot of them do. And then they realize it's in the Old Testament, the Tanakh, in the prophet Isaiah's writings, Isaiah 53, that remember the complete scroll of Isaiah was found back in 1946 when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. The complete, complete finished scroll, 24 feet long, was in a jar and was perfectly preserved. Did you know that? I think God did that for a reason. I think he did that intentionally for us to have it today, especially right around the same time that the nation of Israel was born again as a nation, just like Ezekiel chapters 36 and 37 point out, just like C.H. Spurgeon believed that that was going to be a fulfillment someday. He was that was back in the 1800s, way before Israel was a nation or even close to being a nation. Again, these great evangelists like C.H. Spurgeon and Billy Graham and and even Dr. Martin Luther King, they were all strong supporters of Israel, my friend. So, hey, we're going to get into Isaiah 53 next. Right now, let's hold on. This is going to be so good. So, hey, this is my new book. How to find or see Jesus, excuse me, see Jesus in the Old Testament. And you could see it August 25th, 2024. It'll be finished and it'll be available on Amazon.com. Calm, so check it out, my friend. All right, these One for Israel videos, hey, don't miss them. Check them out. They're so, so good. So Isaiah 53, and we're going to be reading from the Dead Sea Scrolls. We're going to be seeing the original uh, stuff. This was the Dead Sea Scrolls were written around 200 years, at least, before the birth of Christ. This is an amazing thing, and the text is almost identical to the original text that they had, which was like dated like a thousand years later. The the oldest manuscript was like around, I think it was like eight hundred uh, or around a thousand um, A.D. after you know Jesus was born. But this goes much back. This goes further back. This goes before the birth of Christ. And that's what makes this so amazing, my friend. So Isaiah 53 from the Dead Sea Scroll. Let's start getting into it right now. Who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of Yahweh? And yes, this is the name of God. For many years that people wondered, like, was it Yahweh? Was it Jehovah? It is Yahweh has been revealed. So to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? The reason we know that this is his name is they found another scroll, even dating way back further to like Joshua's time. And it's a little lead scroll that they found in the area where Joshua was in Israel. And it has the name of God as Yahweh. Isn't that awesome? We actually get to know that because they wouldn't even pronounce his name in Jesus's time. They wouldn't even spell it. That's how we get the, it was like the L and the D or G dash D. Even to this day, they want, and they called it him, Cheshem, which means the name, but they wouldn't say Yahweh. But here we can say it. And I can say it as a Christian because we have total access to God, freedom to come to the holiest and holy place, to the throne of God anytime because of who? His son, Yeshua, Jesus. Yes. All right. Let's get back into the presentation. So here we are. And verse two, for the for he grew up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no good looks or majesty when we see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. So apparently Jesus wasn't this big, attractive guy. He was despised and rejected by men. Wow. A man of suffering and acquainted with disease. 
And he was despised as one from whom men hid their face, and we didn't respect him. Surely he has borne our sickness and carried our suffering, yet we considered him plagued and struck by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. That is super, super powerful stuff right there, you guys. He was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for what? For our iniquities, our sin. This speaks of Jesus through and through, my friend. In fact, I was able to go see the actual Dead Sea Scrolls back in the early 2000s with my wife. They were there in Seattle, which is only about you know an hour and a half from where I live. And at that time, I didn't really even want to go. I was I was kind of a backslidden Christian, and and uh, my wife's like, "Come on, let's go." So we went to the Seattle Center, and in the museum there, they had the the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they had the Scroll of Isaiah there in this dark room to help keep it preserved. And right next to it was the interpretation in English. And when I read that, and I looked at the old ancient writing, and I read it over here. It was as if God was shining a light down upon me, his light. And he was saying, this speaks of my son. And when I read it, it broke my heart. It was the gospel in the Old Testament. And it was part of drawing me back to him to recommit my life to Jesus. And it did happen right around that time. Really cool stuff. (laughs) It was such an amazing time. All right, let's get back into it. So he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. Doesn't that sound like the New Testament? The punishment that brought our peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. By his wounds, those stripes from being scourged and whipped, the, the pierced hands and the feet, all of it by his wounds, the, the crown of thorns pushed down on him, the beatings that he was taking leading up to this, all of that was to, to make us healed, right? And that's what that scripture says. Here it is again. The punishment that brought our peace was on him and by his wounds, we are healed. Wow. And all we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way. There's no one that does good, right? Not one, as the psalmist wrote. And Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's right. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. You just have to decide whether or not you're going to accept that free gift of being forgiven. And at the end of this episode, you are going to have that opportunity, my friend, to give your life to Jesus Christ and to be forgiven. The greatest need that you have, that I have, that anyone who ever lived has is to be forgiven by God. That's what we need. And here you see that in the Old Testament, it's proclaimed that it is Jesus and Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity or the sin of us all. All sin was laid upon him when he was on that cross. He was oppressed, yet when he was afflicted, he didn't open his mouth. Remember that? And as a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and as a sheep that before his shearers is silent, so he did not open. He didn't open his mouth. You could read that in the Gospels, how he was silent before the Sanhedrin. And he was taken away by oppression and judgment. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living and stricken for the disobedience of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, right? Remember he was, there was two criminals on both sides of Jesus and with a rich man in his death. Remember Joseph of Arimathea gave Jesus his 
a rich man's tomb, and it was carved out of solid rock, the scriptures say. And it, and it says specifically in the scriptures that no dead man had been in there. No man had def, dead man had defiled that tomb. It was a fresh, clean tomb, and Jesus went into it. This, this is where his, he, his dead body was, and that's where he was raised from the dead. The stone was rolled away, and he was raised from the dead. What's amazing about that is that there was another Joseph at Jesus' birth. And he was also, he was not in the tomb, but in the womb that had not been defiled by dead man. The Virgin Mary, remember that? And Jesus was born. He was born as a man. He was God and he was born as a man. It's this mystery that's really hard for us to understand. But Joseph took his the, the baby, God, the son, the baby, out of that undefiled womb as it came out, and he wrapped it in cloth. Well, this Joseph of Arimathea, at the death of Jesus at the cross, also wrapped Jesus' body in cloth, it says in the scriptures, and he put him in the undefiled tomb, not the womb, but the tomb. And what happened in three days? Jesus burst forth out of that tomb this time, not the womb, but the tomb, as the first fruits of the living, the first to be born again, so to speak, so that you and I can live forever and ever. We will be we will be bursting forth as the first fruits when we die as well because of what Jesus did on the cross. Amazing, amazing stuff, is it not? Wow, these scriptures are so good. God's word is good. And although he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, so he was perfect. Yet it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. He was, he has caused him to suffer. It pleased God. Why? Because God knew it was the, the way he was going to save you and me. So when you make his soul an offering for sin, he will see his offspring. So he was seeing that he would have many who would believe in him and live. So he will prolong his days and Yahweh's pleasure will prosper in his hand. Now we're speaking of his millennial reign when he rules and reigns from Jerusalem, right? And after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light and be satisfied. What light is he going to see? He's going to see you and me if you're a believer, because we are also called the light of the world. Jesus said, you are also the light of the world. He said, I am the light of the world. And you are also little, you know, we're little Christians. That's where they got the term Christians. It meant like little Christs. We're little images and, and, and portraits of him as we follow him. We begin to look more and more like him, right? Well, we also are the light of the world for Jesus. We do that for him as good work. And here it says in verse 11 of Isaiah 53, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light and be satisfied. He's satisfied when we do good works for him. And my righteous servant will justify many by the knowledge of himself, and he will bear their iniquities. There's only one who ever lived who bore the sins of the world, and that is Yeshua Hamashiach, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ, right? He is the only one. He was the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. And because he poured out his soul to death and was counted with the transgressors, yet he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Only God can do that. And that's why Jesus is God the Son. He was the only one found worthy who can do this, who could who could pay the price for you and me because he was the perfect lamb of God. Remember, you had to have an unblemished, perfect lamb with you in order to go into that temple and to worship God freely. The, the lamb was examined, scrutinized, and inspected, not the worshiper, just the lamb. The priest would cross-examine and look at the lamb, and when it was found approved, you were free to go in and worship and your sins would be forgiven. So this is so amazing, you guys, how all of this was put together for you and for me. And if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that right now, my friend. You could be born again. 
you can receive that free gift that Isaiah was prophesying about around 700 years before the birth of Christ. And that manuscript dates back to 200 years before Christ at at least. So this is legit. This is real stuff. And you may be feeling a knock right now, a gentle knock on the door of your heart. That is the Holy Spirit who's saying you need to be born again, to receive Jesus, to be born again. Would you like to do that? You can do it right now, right where you're at. This is business between you and God, Yahweh. Nobody else. Business between you and Yahweh. And you need his forgiveness. And how do you get it? By believing and trusting in Jesus Christ and following him, that's how. So if you'd like to do that, hey, say this prayer after me right now. Just stop what you're doing. Say this prayer from your heart to God. Okay, you ready? Repeat these words after me. We're gonna pray. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I am sorry for my sin. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for me. I also believe that in three days he was raised from the dead and he is alive today. I choose to follow him as my Lord and as my Savior from this day forward. I pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, my friend. If you did that, heaven rejoices right now over what you did. It says that heaven rejoices over one who repents. That means turning around from their evil ways and turning to God, to Yahweh. So congratulations, my friend. And make sure you go to a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church or a ministry. Make sure you're getting fellowship with other believers. And make sure you pray, talk to God every day. Talk to Him all the time. It's good for you. It's good for me. All right. Well, God bless you. Hey, don't forget hit this playlist right here, how to find Jesus in the Old Testament. You will be blessed by it. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the bell. You won't miss a thing, my friend. So click on this playlist right here.